Welcome back to the podcast. Listen, today I got a great guest for you. I'm really excited. Uh, been wanting to get him on for quite some time. I've known of him in the industry. Uh, he's a firearms instructor, but more than that, just a just a really just an innovative thinker. You know, it's oftentimes I'll get guys from the special operations community, all friends of mine, and most of them are awesome guys. Uh, some of them have a harder time dealing with civilians. You know how to train civilians correctly. Jeff is not one of those guys. Um, yes, who, I'm t- who am I talking about? I am talking about my friend Jeff Gonzalez from Trident Concepts. Jeff, for over 20 years, has been training civilians in his concepts. Very well respected in the community, very well respected in the special warfare community. Um, we go into a lot in this interview, um, talk about some of our backgrounds. Actually, we, we had uh, some crossover uh, when I was in the Intel days. And uh, we talk about that, but it's really interesting to get Jeff's perspective on the way things, you know, progressed and how the fact that you're going to be finding out that he was one of the first guys really in the spec ops uh, world, as far as uh, naval special warfare to start looking at the problem of how to conceal carry. You would think that would be something that uh, everybody would know, but the history of how it evolved and how he um, was able to come up with new concepts on concealed carry uh, for, you know, then special operations community, but now, you know, civilians. He's also got just such a sane and sober approach. He's just a really, really great individual. And I think you're going to really get a lot out of this as far as, uh, you know, your training, how to look at concealed carry, and how to look at, you know, self-protection from the whole aspect of it. I love when somebody is highly qualified, but they're also very relatable. And that's what Jeff is. So I think you're going to really enjoy this interview that I have with Jeff. Now, if you are ready to start putting together a plan for you and your family, please go to surviveviolence.com, give us your email, and we will give you immediately a manifesto, basically, that has 20-something modules uh, that will start putting together a program for you and your family to minimize the chance of violence coming in your life, because really that's what we want to do. And this is a great way to start. And it's immediately actionable information. And literally, right after you give us your email, you can download it right away. So again, surviveviolence.com. Now, let me introduce the great Jeff Gonzalez. Jeff Gonzalez, finally got you on, man. (laughs) I know. Thank you. First of all, thank you for for having me on. I'm excited. It's my pleasure to be here. You know, it's so funny. You, uh, we had not met. Uh, prior to SHOT Show, physically, you know, in, in mm-hmm. there. And what was so interesting is your name kept coming up in all my circles, you know, for a long time. And, um, you know, the, the podcast that, that I do here and then the information I put out is is really relevant to people's, you know, self-protection and everything. What I found out with your background, it's funny, we're pretty close. We're pretty close in timeline. I'm, I'm, I'm older. Um, you know, I was there, I was like 10 classes earlier than you. Um, but the, I heard you in some other podcasts talking and that was like my whole time frame. And so it, <laughs> it, it's so it. funny. We could do a whole, and we may do this later, but that time, that time of development in special, uh, in special operations community was amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, I started out, uh, I blew my ears. I was actually going to team four. It was funny. Oh, no way. Yeah. I was going to team four and, uh, you know, who ended up taking my spot? Who's that? John Connor. No way. Yeah. Yeah. He was, wow. two, he was two classes behind me. And uh, he, he great kid from Boston, just fucking hilarious. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we were in there and, we, and it just, uh, it was just, it was surreal. Um, oh, not that, yeah, you know, man. I, mean, I named my first son Connor after him. Um, oh, wow. Uh, but, you know, what? the reason I'm starting out with this for everybody is what, what I love about your story um, is that you were there kind of at the beginning this is every origin story i hear on training methodologies and stuff it usually is something like this where it's just like oh shit we got to do this now how do we do it you know and and you coming up and being one of the first guys to really have to have to think about low visibility um how people carry how they do you were there when it does not have all the high speed stuff that we have today and in the thought process and everything and the reason I think that's so important is because, yes, we've had, especially with the pandemic, we've had this huge increase in everybody getting weapons. And, but I see very few people really understanding training. And even when they get their concealed carry, 
there's a lot of things they haven't considered. And just listening to you uh, with other interviews with you know friends of mine and people I know, mm. uh, you cover such great info that way. But can you start a little bit about, um, obviously, you went in and, and you went through the teams. You were pulled out prior. That's, that's what I found was fascinating. You were, you were pulled out of STT, which is uh, still, still, uh, uh, advanced training for the, for the teams, basically, yeah. before you had your Trident and you were thrust yeah. into a platoon to participate essentially, um, yeah. you know, in, in, in Panama, which was, which was wild. Um, so you had that experience yeah. of going in and then you were starting to do some things where you were doing what they call, you know, the, the, the word for it now is obviously low visibility, yeah. but it's really basically you guys were going into denied areas. A lot of times you're yeah. in, in civilian clothes and you had to figure out how to carry without really being noticeable. And, oh, yeah. and so there's a lot of thought process, but it, w- I think what's so fascinating with people is that time in the, in the world. Yes. It started to get a little bit, you know, with, with Grenada, there was a little bit of exposure with the teams, but it wasn't like it is now. Mm-mm. Nobody really, I remember when I went in, they tried to talk me out of getting my, when I got my commission and they did everything they could to talk me out of going to special warfare. Oh, it, sure. It, it was the redheaded stepchildren of the Navy and uh, no career path. And you, you had to love the job, you know, if you wanted mm. to go in there and you were seen as some sort of a, just a, a, you know, a miscreant, you know, for going in there <laughs> by, by a lot of the rest of the Navy, they respected you, but they, you know, they just thought, yeah, you know, why would you ever want to do that job type of thing? Um, and it was interesting to hear you because when you had to research getting into the teams, it was the same thing. We had to go to the library. There was, oh, God. There's, there's really no information out there. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. I will say this. It's so it's so nice to hear you bring up John's name. Um, so when I was still in STT, we were out at AP Hill doing our land warfare. And we were out there. I want to think we were living literally on the range. We put up tents and we stayed literally on the range. And um, John came up along with the chief. And I had it. I'd, I'd met John at the team area. Uh, you know, but I, I was a new guy and I immediately like got thrust into STT. So I didn't really see him a lot, but him and, and, uh, Doug McFall, they came out to AP Hill. And I remember our, my STT class, there was only two of us from SEAL team four, myself and this other guy, this other corpsman. And they came out to let us know that we were both going into their platoon. Wow. And they were like, you know, they, 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 they'd come out and observed us in other parts of training. And then they came out to say that, you know, powers to be have given um, that they have assigned us to their platoon. And so my first platoon was supposed to be John's platoon. And what ended up happening. So I would have then, you know, basically keep your nose clean, get through STT. And as soon as you're done, you platoon up with with me. And what ended up happening was one of the guys in the platoon that I ended up going into broke his leg on a fast roping operation. And so that platoon was a man short, but that platoon was also being tasked to already start working on target packages. So they had like, they couldn't wait to fill that slot. So they pulled me out. That's how come I got pulled out of STT early is because they were already ramping up to do things. And so they needed they needed the, that man that they're missing man. And I was the missing man. So I got pulled out of STT and I missed going into John's platoon. Um, but, you know, looking back hindsight, had I been in that platoon, I mean, there's, there's a good chance that I mean, I've been here today to talk to you. So, um, and I can remember him, man. I, I do. There were two guys from Boston at the team area, him and Brian Brackett, and they both had the thickest, Oh yeah. I accent. I can still hear Brian and I can like understand every other word. Like I have like I'm not stupid. I just can't understand you. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a poor, you know, I'm a, I come from Central Texas. We don't talk like that there. So <laughs> I have no idea what you're telling me right now. Anyhow, so that that was my um one of the John Connor stories that I had and yeah, I mean, such a great dude. He really was. I mean, I, I miss him. And it's it's good to hear his name brought up again. I, I had no idea that you had that type of connection with him, which makes yeah, this it, even more important. You know, it's going through, you're going through buds. There's, there's a group of us. And back then, you know, officers, we were really, it wasn't like, this is pre-academy days before yeah. the academy boys all got in there. <laughs> you know, so we were all just, you know, regular dudes. And um, John, John was just such a funny kid. You know, he was just so, he's just a ball buster. 
and just a great big personality you know and yeah. in fact the only time i saw the kid humbled was during hell week he finally like the fourth day of hell week he was just i saw him and i was just laughing at him and you know and, yeah. it, and he's sitting there he's just it all never seen so ragged you know <laughs> it yeah. catches up yeah it was, it was um, good. but but for those of the you know i'm sorry I'm, i probably should have no. set this up um john connor was 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 one of the people killed at uh, Petit Airfield. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, he was the first person killed. Um, yeah, in, um, in, in I can't recall. Crossfire. I think he's the first one that died. That uh, died. Yeah, was the first one that was. He wasn't the first one that was shot, but he he died of his wounds before everybody else. Yeah, and, and um, that, yeah, him. That was just tragic. I, I was yeah. I was at Spec War Command. I was uh, I was Intel. Um, oh at, wow! That time. They had me. I was you know my fantasy was where my my ears were going to miraculously heal and I was going to get to go back. Of course, yeah, 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 so, yeah. But I'm working for Lemoyne and everybody while we were there, <laughs> and I had all the I had like the legends of the SEAL teams. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had guys like Kim Erskine, and you had Roger Hayden. You had you just all these you know crazy you know Vietnam era guys and stuff. Really, yeah. really good dudes. Um. But what was what was interesting was, you know, it was surreal. I I'd, I'd gone down the, the working the working um thing the working uh uh it went down as just cause, but but that we were working at as a blue spoon basically. Oh know? yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so you know, and I was down there every time when it was supposed to happen. It was supposed to happen like three or four times, right? And so I'm seriously, yeah. <laughs> I'm like everybody. I'm at the Marriott down there, just going, okay, what's it going to happen? You know, and of course, yeah. one time I go back and my my compatriot goes down. That's when it happens. Oh wow! But he's, but he's relaying everything to us, you know, and I'm I'm kind of filtering it through. And then and when it was, just, I had I took such a pause when I had to say John's name. I was just, yeah, like, you know, it was just it was crazy. It um, was rough. Yeah, because I knew him. Sure. Kim Kim Torgerson was shot down there. He was oh, uh, yeah. he was in 146 with with uh, with us, and um, yeah, I knew a couple of people who were there. But what was so interesting about that time, and again, it ties into what we're about to talk about from an EDC standpoint. That was a wake up call for everybody. You know, the one cool thing about me being in a strategic command like that at that time, everybody understood. Oh, you know, like it's unthinkable today, but we couldn't talk to each other. We couldn't we couldn't talk to the the uh, Air Force. Yeah. We couldn't. Uh, so a, a lot of people ended up that wouldn't have died if they had proper medical attention. It just mm. you couldn't get anybody there. It was just there were so many lessons, unfortunate lessons learned out of that. Yeah, um, it's true. It, it, it was it was crazy. It's true. But it was a, it was a uh, God, it was a it's hard to put it in words. I mean, obviously, the guys that went straight into co a combat theater have an understanding of it. But the you know, this was. Yeah, I mean, you're right. The first real skirmish post Vietnam was Grenada and then just cause. And then there were a couple of little things that happened that we were on, you know, we were advisors for and, and things like that. But one of the things that I can remember was working in that time period, the, um, you know, cause back then we worked under AOs. So every command had their own AO. And, right. and as you know, SEAL Team 4's AO was central in South America. Yeah which meant that we were actively involved in counter drug and counter, uh, you know, basically anything having to do with counter drug and narco terrorism. We were heavily involved in that. And, and that, it was, that, that's where, that's where everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to go. It, to it's, I mean, honestly, what's funny is like, I can remember in third phase when we put up our dream sheets, I put seal team one, seal team three, seal team five, SDV team one. That's so all cool. we all, West, all Coast. West Coast teams, all West Coast teams. <laughs> and and uh, like when the orders got read, I was the only one in my buds class. The guy that was um, the guy that was already at the command, the other new guy, if you will, he was two classes before me. And then there wasn't anybody that came to came from buds. I think it was like it was almost like 159 before we got the next new guy. So it was almost like a year before well yeah it was a long time i i'd already gotten through stt and i had already gone and done my first downrange trip and then the first new guys start to filter in and get platooned up right away yeah. so it was it was a really interesting time but um i can remember like uh the ex the um the co and the command master chief came out to the island while we were out there and they were trying to sell it it's so funny to me thinking back to that they're like boys you want to get in the shit 
you want to go to SEAL Team 4. We are actively, you know, we're pursuing these guys. I mean, they talked to, they you know, obviously it was a little bit different once you got on the ground there. Right. But in your head, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go fucking hunting these terror, these narco terrorists. Oh, God, yeah, I'm going to go, you know, shoot these guys in the face. And you're just foaming in the mouth. And what's funny is I can remember that. And I'm thinking, mm, you know, I don't want to go to the East Coast because I started on the East Coast. You know, I went to a school out there at Damn Neck. And so, yeah. Uh, the east coast was like you did in Mitzi? uh well yes yes yeah, yes god i had to think about that for a second yeah. yeah and uh it was funny because you know i was out there in the winter time so i was going through a school when it was winter out in virginia beach and it was just miserable and ugly and blah oh yeah and i you know when i got out to california as a bud student it was sunny and beautiful the whole time and i just was like i just want to stay in california you know, that literally was what I wanted in my uh, career for my career path. And I remember when they called out the orders and I was the only one in the class that had orders to go to SEAL Team 4. And I remember one of the instructors, Instructor Faye, he comes up to me and he's like, you're going to see some shit. And I was <laughs> like, really? OK. <laughs> and so, you know, little did I know, you know, yeah. uh, like nine months later, 10 months, whatever it was. There, are, you know, we were downrange doing stuff. So yeah. um, the mission profile that we had to, to I, I think this this mission profile extends throughout all the AOs of that time period, but it was different in our AO. Our AO, aside from the Middle East, was very volatile. Right. I mean, you know, if you knew anything about what was happening in that time period, narco terrorism was terrorism directed against the infrastructure of the country to destabilize it so that they could continue. So that was when they were assassinating judges, assassinating politicians, assass assassinating um, media types. And I'm not just talking about like just putting a bullet in their head. I'm talking about making a statement with by the, by their acts and to, to what we see in Mexico. I mean, what, what we see in Mexico is not new. I mean, it was happening over in Central and South America decades before that. It just became much more prolific and much more in our face because it's literally happening in, in our, like in our neighborhood with a neighbor. Right. So when we would go down range, you know, we would always get this brief to talk about, you know, do's and don'ts and the, the, the importance of maintaining a low profile because we weren't, when we were on the job, we were kitted up. We were ready to go. Yeah. Like if we got hit while we were in that capacity, it, it was obviously bad, but we had our tools of the trade. But it was the mobility stuff that we would do. It was where we were staying. We would usually stay in hotels that were, you know, quote, nice hotels. But, you know, everybody's on the take down there. As soon as they find out Amer where Americans are, you know, it's just, you know, the it's a tough it's a tough place to be in in that sense. And so, you know, kidnappings were really, really high. Um, and to kidnap an American was really a, uh, a very, it was a cash cow, you know, oh, yeah. that back then kidnapping was very, very prolific. I mean, it's still prolific in many, many parts of the world, but it's very prolific back then. And so, you know, the whole low profile thing was something that was bred in me very, very early. And, you know, I can remember we would go down range and they would back then, relaxed grooming standards meant that we just didn't have to get haircuts right we couldn't really grow full beards and things like that but they would allow us to let our hair grow we it, um the only types of of camis that we traveled with were the work camis not uniform camis like the ones that were all you know kitted out they had all the pockets everywhere they you know there was no military bearing about them no insignias they were very sterile everything was sterile like we would go through the process of removing tags from everything so there was no indication of where or who we were kind of thing if you left a piece of gear behind type thing and um you know it became very clear to me how important it was to not get noticed to not become an attraction and i'm i'm traveling i can blend in to like three quarters of the world right. you know just because of my complexion because of my nationality i can do that and you know back then i spoke the language so it's really easy for me to kind of like rap a little bit and get us out of things and whatnot but um you know i'm traveling with somebody that looked like you you know because a lot of the guys in my platoon were like oh, yeah. six foot plus California boys, you know, they look good. I mean, it's kind of hard to blend in with somebody like that. So you had to really take your game to a whole new level. 
to do that. And, you know, that didn't even really even broach the subject of being armed. I mean, I can remember, you know, like that was one idea, like we just need to be able to sneak in and sneak out without drawing attention to ourselves. And that worked great. Like we did a lot of stuff, you know, like we, you know, we ran routes, we did, you know, surveillance detection stuff. We did all the, all the, all the trade craft stuff that is commonplace now, nowadays was stuff that we kind of did. And I didn't even know we were doing it. A lot of times I was just observing what the senior guys in the platoon were, were doing, you know, what they were doing. Like, why are we, what, we should have turned there. No, you know, we're checking for tails or we're doing this or, you know, things like that. And I'm like, oh, so cool, you know? And um, so when, when weapons came into the equation, there was no real like idea of how to truly carry concealed. You know, we didn't have any concealment. And I, I always frame this so people have an understanding, you know, back then um, from a concealment point of view, and it wasn't even called concealment back then. Back then, it, the only reference that you had to carrying a firearm um, in plain clothes or in regular street clothes was off duty. Right. Those were the only the only professionals that were doing it. Uh, and those were like your detectives, mm -hmm. your UCs. Um, so I got fortunate to me because, um, you know, we had interaction with uh, the one of the biggest federal agencies that we had a lot of interaction with was the DEA. Yeah, yeah. They would work with us. And, and in fact, some of the guys from the teams actually lateraled over to the DEA and, and did work with them. So I got a chance to kind of um, get an insight into that kind of world, the UC world and how guys, you know, have to be, you know, low key at that point for that type of a scenario and that was well, that was a whole new game right there and i'm like i am so glad i don't have to do it but it was nice to have that insight and observe how they did it and what what why they were doing it so carrying a firearm in in the early stages was more like being a uc right you you didn't have you know there wasn't an off-duty plainclothes detective where you had a nice holster and a good gun belt and you had clothes to support it kind of thing the best way to explain it was we were all portraying UC undercover agents in third world countries. Yeah. And, and the, and the gun that we were carrying was the primary sidearm, uh, the 226. So yeah. it's not an easy gun to conceal, especially on a frame such as mine. I mean, I had to create these kind of interesting ways to carry it. Um, those that have a good, in, good memory or good insight into terrorism know that there was a terrorist group indigenous to the Philippines called the Sparrows. And they were a political faction that executed so many political figures. But what the reason why I bring this up is because they, they were caught, I, to my knowledge, one time on a closed circuit TV of the assassination. And to watch this super thin framed guy walk up to somebody in regular street clothes and this is in the pi so like we're not talking we're talking shorts like like yeah like pt shorts and a t-shirt and pull out a full-size 1911 and shoot the guy in the head at point blank range to watch that happen and watch how fast it happened he didn't have a holster no holster whatsoever and uh, as you know 1911 is not a light firearm yeah. it's a heavy clunk of metal if, if so i like, remember that video jeff too the 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 guy that got shot, the victim, he was astonished. He he actually watched it as it came up towards him. So the, yes, that one. But the one that I'm talking, the, the SOP that they would use, the one that I'm referencing is the the hitman would get a positive facial recognition of his mark, walk past him, two or three steps about face, and it, it was in that about oh. face. It was in that like that's the other thing. So it's like doing an El Presidente. Yeah. Uh, where he would spin around and as he's turning, so he's not even standing facing the target. He's literally taking and making an about face and drawing the gun and shooting the guy in the back of the head. That was the one that I saw wow. uh, that I, I kept a, I used to have a, um, a hard drive which, with all these various types of terrorist, mainly assassinations, but bombings and kidnappings and things caught on tape, shit like that, and just studied them. I mean, that was part of my job was, was being in the intel field as well, is studying that stuff. And so my 
when I saw that and I, you know, I was like, well, I mean, that guy couldn't be much bigger than me. Um, and the gun that he was carrying couldn't, I mean, it probably weighed more than my SIG, right. but my SIG was fatter yep. than, than yep. it. So, the bulky you know, dude. I'm thinking, yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, I got to figure out how to carry this. If that guy can do it, then I got to figure out a good way to do it myself. And, you know, it was no holster and it was appendix. And I always, I tell people this, that the way I carried it to make it work. Um, do, you, do you remember like the old Ernie Hill speed leather belts that we used to have? The, oh, yeah. the, uh, the original issue. I still have my original issue one. So that was the belt that I would wear and it was nice and thick. And I would take the SIG and I would put it in barrel facing down. And then I would take the magazine, what magazine, the base of the magazine and rotate it 180, well, 90 degrees. So the magazine is facing up. Right. So the now the muzzle is sideways. And that allowed me to carry it on my frame a lot better because the belt obscured the entire just about the entire profile. And you know, the the ability to get that pistol out was it wasn't as easy as it is now with the with the innovation and the evolution of holsters that we have right. especially for concealed carry they've changed so much in the in that time period but it was such an awesome time to try it. and again here's what's so ironic i just took it for granted i just kind of like well this is my job i just need to do this is i need to you know i want to come home i need to be good at this um when we're running amok and you know because then you'd go out for dinners then you mm -hmm. go out for drinks then you go out and socialize and you would do all this stuff that put you in close contact to some high risk activities that you know it's like i can't remember there's one time <laughs> my swim buddy and i we were in oh was it i want to think it was cartagena colombia it was either cartagena or bogota i can't remember which one and um we are and i mean sometimes it would just be two of us Right. So, I mean, there's no QRF. There's no extra force coming to help us. It's just us. We have to fight our way out, uh, whatever the situation is. And <laughs> so we're at we're at this cafe and it became kind of like a favorite cafe of ours. And we're eating outside. And they had like a little patio area and then they had the main restaurant and we're sitting there eating. They have the umbrellas and they have like a um, like potter, like potted plant thingies up front and by the street. And we're just sitting there enjoying this nice, just beautiful time of the year. It's all nice. And all of a sudden, gunshots erupted all around us. And Noel and I, like the first thing we did, we look at each other to just, that's gunshots, right? We both recognize that's gunshots. And we dove to the ground. And then we started low crawling into the <laughs> into the actual building itself. And okay. we, we low crawled all the way. I don't think we low crawled all the way into the kitchen, but we kind of like low ran all the way into the kitchen. And the owner is like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Calm down. Calm down. World Cup. Colombia just won the World Cup. So <laughs> Colombia, Team Colombia had just won the World Cup and they were celebrating in the streets. But Noel and I freaked out because it was there was a lot of gunfire happening. And, oh, wow. you know, when you're when you're not necessarily when you're not on a range where you're not the one that's actually letting loose the rounds, it can be a little bit unsettling. Oh yeah. So that was kind of like the time period that we that I grew up in in that part of the world and yeah, it really did set me up to be extremely successful in the low biz concealed carry um kind of world. Um you know, it was uh, is also something I didn't really imagine would be such an important part of what we do th at this point. Um when we first started the company, you know, we were I mean, heavy in the GWAT. I mean, just about everything we did was an advanced rifle class or was some sort of assault program to go with the rifle class, or it was just something that tied into all of that kind of direct action component. So um, concealed carry didn't come around to us until it was much later. I would say it was probably about, uh, I would say maybe 10 to 12 years after we'd already been doing work that all of a sudden the concealed carry and the, the irony was the concealed carry came to us because of um, some, some of the guys that were coming back to me saying, Hey, you know what, we're, um, we're, we're, we're needing to take over the intelligence gathering component to our mission profile. And we need to have the capacity to send guys into other theaters to be able to do that. And we've been just fighting a war in the middle East 
forever and guys have kind of forgotten that you know what what we the term became rest of world row so we still have rest of world responsibilities that we have you know northern europe we've got central and south america we've got asia we've got all these other locations that have different climates that require different conditions in which you will carry concealed in the performance of your duties so we got a call to do a program and I, I mean, it was great because the irony is that that program, we couldn't actually do it on a naval installation. They, um, because we were drawn from concealment inside the waistband, it was very um, taboo, if you will, according to the range officers. They just were like not cool yeah. with that. I can't tell you how many <laughs> times, like when there's innovations and when there's things like this, the <laughs> resistance from people, like yeah. it, everybody thinks... I was all cutting edge. No, it's usually a couple of individuals like yourself and, yeah. and, and the, the hoop, hoops you got to jump through. Oh, my God. We we ended up having to go all the way up to Quantico to the HRP, the Marine Corps uh, HRP, oh, yeah. a... which I love those guys. They were so gracious. They let us come in there. They We taught the class. They had two of their Marines that came through the class. And I this is this is the kind of like the uh, the momentum, the snowball that started. We did that class, which was great. But then what ended up happening was the Marine Corps asked me to come back and do a class. And then one of the staff sergeants that was in that class deployed to Pendleton. He called me up. We went out there. Now, Pendleton was very different from Quantico. And they were like, no, you can't do any of that stuff on Pendleton. So we had to use a civilian law enforcement range. And they brought in some of their um, detectives and low, low, their UC guys to come into that class. They had an entire, they had a whole unit de- devoted to that sort of thing. You know, it's most, mo- I mean, most of your investigations, you know, whether it's, whether it's dope, whether it's, you know, all the sex crimes, they all work plain clothes, yeah. you know, so it's, it's a very popular thing. So um, we did it for them. The, the, there was just a couple of their guys in there. So then they liked it. So they called me back out to do a class for them. Right. And then I did a class for them, but we couldn't get range time because their range was um, not available. So we had to use a civilian range and the civilian range, I, everybody and their grandmother saw what we were doing. And, and then people came up and were asking, hey, what are you guys doing? Because it was so different right. at the time. Imagine the only type of like formalized instruction that was happening at that time. You usually had like plate carriers and rifles and you were running and like, you know, you had your you know multi-cam gear all over you know you look like the walking bushes and stuff like that and and so here we are in just regular civilian closes but you can't see any of our gear can't see any of it we're running and gunning this way and and it just caught people's eyes and so before you know it enough people asked me and we did our first open enrollment concealed carry class in los angeles in uh, i think it was like 2014 2015 wow. and and after that it just became kind of like a um a staple for what we did and we started doing it uh, you know we do it all now it's it's become one of the most popular programs that we do in fact you know we still get calls to do the low vis stuff we still get calls to do kind of like working in the non-permissive environments where you know you really can't be seen with you, you can't you have to have zero signature so no no residual presence whatsoever of any type of weapon system so you know that means no holsters no sheaths no no anything that could be tied to the fact that you were carrying something like at the moment you get rolled up maybe you don't have anything on you but you still have an empty holster yeah or you still have a knife sheath somewhere you know so you, i mean that, that's a whole new game to try to play it at that level particularly when the risks are that high you know i mean there are so many times when you um you absolutely do not want to be the the reason that there's a congressional hearing because you did something in a foreign country. That's the last thing that any of any of us ever wanted. So, you know, we're already very cautious to begin with. And, you know, you add, you add all the other ramifications uh, that go along with it. And so, you know, you played it really, you, you played it very, I mean, the game was real. I mean, there were, there are some places I can remember that we were absolutely forbidden to go to. Like we would get our country brief, our in-country brief from the, RSO at the embassy and they would have the big map on the wall and there would be this red zone. Do not go into the red zone. Right. Red zone is prohibited. No Americans can go into the red zone. And we'd be like, really? Well, why can't they go there? You know, it's just right. curious. Cause you know, 
uh, the red zone in Europe is different than the red zone right. in Central and South America. Right. So we're right. like, what do you mean we can't go there kind of thing? <laughs> So then, you know, we find out that, you know, two American servicemen were killed in a drive-by shooting just down the road from here. And then there was, you know, a European national that was kidnapped and murdered and or raped and murdered. And so, you know, it's like, oh, OK, that kind of red zone. Fair enough. We'll stay out of there, you know. And it, it's so, you know, you really did you really did have to try to understand the differences in in that time period and, and from where we're at right now. You know, obviously, some of the places you go to, you still have to be obviously pretty careful. Like any of the war zones, obviously, you have to be very, very careful. But you know, those those places are a lot harder to do low vis stuff, just because you have to understand the cultural differences, in particular, the wardrobe requirements, and why it makes it difficult. It doesn't make it difficult in some places; it makes it easier. But you have to you have to kind of have that full buy in right. that you can't if you want to not attract attention, you have to look like everybody else. Yeah. And if you can't look like everybody else because you're, you know, you're six foot four blonde kind of thing, well, you have to cover that up. And, you know, that's where you cover it up with clothing and local wardrobe and stuff like that. And, you know, that was, that was what we brought to the community at large, not just our community, but other special operations communities and even the law enforcement side of the house was that mindset of, Hey, listen, this is not about your favorite setup. Um, your favorite setup might work in this area, but now you're going from, you know, the Central American climate to Northern Europe in the winter time. Yeah. That setup isn't going to work. Yeah, it's not going to work. You can't. You can't. You know, it's not going to buy. You're going to have to find another alternative, and that's the whole reason that the program has been successful. Is that I don't really care what methodology and what 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 you choose to carry and how you choose to carry it. But I want you to have an idea that the reason why, you know, I don't, I don't, it's hard to kind of get this philosophy across to people, but what I want is I want people to live their lives. I want you to live a fulfilling and rich life, but I just want you to be armed in the process. Right. And it's a completely different perspective because early on, the mantra was you had to dress around the gun. You had to wear clothing that supported the gun that you wanted, but that didn't match my wardrobe. I might have one or two pieces of apparel that that worked for, and every other piece of apparel did not work for that. So the idea of dressing around the gun is nice when you're sitting here talking with your buddies that you all wear the exact same clothes, yeah. what I call like your, your, your off range attire which yes. is basically just range attire that you wear off the range. Yes. Um, and, you know, when I look at something like that and, when, you know, the first tactic to carry and conceal is to not draw attention to yourself. It makes it hard to acknowledge that as being a viable method of dressing. I mean, even if that's how you dress, okay, then you have to acknowledge that you are drawn unwanted, unnecessary attention to yourself. Yeah. And that's that's the hard part is that you really need to be able to, to blend in and disappear in some cases. I tell the story. This is a funny, not so funny story. But, you know, there's very few pictures of me in existence in that time period where you see, you know, my hair and I had long hair and I had like a little goatee Fu Manchu type thing going. And I was flying out of one of these countries and we would... Um, you know, we would fly out through customs. We'd have to go through customs, but we'd have an expediter that would kind of process through. And we we were flying on, you know, official passports. So it usually was kind of an easy kind of scenario. It wasn't like everybody else. And this one time, uh, you know, because we would all line up and go one at a time, obviously. And so one of the guys in the front of the line mentioned to the the official there that, hey, the guy in like the, the blue shirt, I think he's got a fake passport. Oh. and yeah so oh. our our official passports we had this was before we really you know because when we would get the call this is this is what was funny is we'd get the call saying okay we, you need to go and get your official passport so you'd have two different passports right you'd have one that had the military bearing in it and then you'd have one that was more kind of a blending pair passport but when you had to go and do it you went to take the pictures of the same day yeah so so my military bearing is in my unofficial passport and so it was like 
okay, that looks a little odd, right? So here I am with this, you know, long hair, you know, facial hair kind of thing. And then there's this military prim and proper picture in my passport. And the girl looks at it and she's like, she she kind of does a double take and, and she she calls for her supervisor. Supervisor takes my passport. And he's like, will you come with me? And, you know, I go with him into this corridor and I literally go into this single room that has literally just a chair and the light bulb on the string. And I remember he opens the door for me and he kind of gestures for me to go in. And I, I think he's going to come in after me. Instead, he just locks the door behind me. Yeah. So I'm in this room all by myself. And and I, I I was thinking at first, okay, the guys are fucking with me. You know, I, I did, you know, I pissed somebody off or somebody didn't get their Wheaties in the morning or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just going to wait this out. I'm just going to sit in this chair and chill, right? And like time was expiring and the bird was on the tarmac waiting for us. And they were doing a hot load, so they never bothered to power off. They literally flew in, oh. just opened up the ramp. We loaded up, and they were going to be gone. So now there's this delay. And um, I don't remember why they were doing a, a hot wash, but for some reason, that was the that was the reason, or that was what they did. And um, as they're doing a head count at the bird, you know, they come up with one short, and, and the OSC and whatnot, the chief are like, well, you know, where's Jeff? What's what, Why is he not here? And one of the guys was like, yeah, he got called and he went into the, some back room area. Oh. And then they're like, what? What? What do you mean? <laughs> you went to this back room? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's not, I didn't, it's not like it was, I didn't not tell anybody. I just kind of no. was like, whatever, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, like I'm, I didn't throw a stink because I just figured, oh, this is just them fucking with me, whatever. I didn't make a scene, is what I should say. Yeah. So then um, the Commodore for that particular nation had been, trained in the u.s and had actually gone through buds oh so you know he spoke really good english um saw i mean these guys these guys were awesome the, to work with this this counterpart this group was so fun they were awesome and so my oic goes running out and the commodore's you know entourage is still there and they got you know his vehicle and he literally he says he says this that he jumped on the hood of the car mm -hmm. to stop it Right. And then he explains what's happened and the Commodore just flips out. He's pissed. And he's now like, he was, I mean, the dude never lost his cool the entire, like we were there for like three weeks, never lost his cool, hung out with us. We had a great time. Just like one of the guys really, right. really was. And he was pissed. I could hear him yelling wow. from inside that little room. And all I can remember is like the door slams open and he just sees me there and he's in his dress whites with his medals, wow. right? Cause there's a big send off. Right. And right. so he, um, he runs in and, and he grabs me by the scruff of my neck and he lifts me up and he's like, just pushing me. And he's yelling at all these officials, like get out of my way. I, he was speaking so fast. He's speaking Spanish so fast that I was hardly, I was having a hard time picking up on everything. I just knew right. this is bad. Right. And whatever's happening here, this is bad. And like his bodyguards are trying to push back the officials and the armed security guys that are there. And I'm like, oh shit, what's going on? You know? Yeah. And there was a big uh like the the window or the the windows to the um to that opened up to the tarmac were just this from floor to ceiling, just beautiful windows, right? Right. So I could see the bird on the tarmac, troop doors open, the ramps up, bird, you know, props are spinning, and the Commodore literally shows me out the door. And then turns around and, and he like hooks his arms under, you know, the crash bars on the door, yeah. the push bars. He hooks his arms on, on those things and he's standing there. And I'm like, Holy uh, shit. And, and like the last thing I remember is like, I can hear somebody yelling from inside the troop door, run. So <laughs> I just start running to the bird. It's like, I don't know, 100 meters to the bird or whatever. I'm running thinking, what the fuck just happened? Wow. And, you know, I get, I, I, I try to jump up to the troop door. It's too high up. They pull me up. They shut the troop door. The, the, you know, the guy, the Air Force guy back, back there, the crew chief, just, I remember him yelling something over the phone. And all of a sudden, full throttle like wow. bird is like moving it's on the taxiway and it's like hauling ass on a taxiway to get to the runway and then it just like there was no delay it literally made the bank around the taxiway onto the runway and just short run short run right takeoff which is like those those kind that are super cool they just almost go ballistic and uh we're up in the air and i'm laying on the floor of the c-130 
I still have my backpack on, you know, yeah. I'm still just kind of like laying there. Everybody's like looking at me and I'm like, what in the fuck just happened? Like, I have no clue. We never found out because the OIC was so pissed. It was the longest, it was a flight back to the States and it was miserable because he was so fucking mad that whole, nobody would fess up. Nobody would, and you know, come clean with who made this Get it. like, yeah, so we oh, never, fuck. I never found out. I don't know if somebody did, but I never found out. So that, that, so my point is that sometimes I would blend in so well that I would actually have a hard time getting out. Yeah. You know, and that happened a couple places where people wouldn't believe me that I was an American. People, you know, I would, um, I would adopt the, you know, the, the culture to some degree. I would, you know, be very um, convincing in my role there as, as what I would do. And it didn't always work. I got I got in trouble plenty of times for, you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time or doing the wrong thing at the wrong place kind of stuff. But, you know, it was extremely valuable. Just so much um, so much learning took place in the, those, you know, all those time, all that all those deployments that I did down there and took that and brought it into the, the concealed carry that we do right now. And and we've had to change it a little bit. Like you said, there's a lot of people that due to. We, we joke about this, but it's the uh, the absolute truth. You um, start a pandemic, um, create violent protest, defund the police, and you have the perfect ingredients for chaos. Yeah. And so many people recognize that. They picked up on that. They're like, this is this is bad. And so the influx of new gun owners, has been huge. I mean, every year we're breaking records on gun sales and stuff like that. I mean, it's like, I don't even know, like I stopped trying to guess when the, when we're going to see a plateau. Cause just when we see somewhat of a plateau, boom, see another spike. It's yeah. just crazy. And so with all these new gun owners, you know, we're trying to, um, we're trying to create an atmosphere where it's also a slightly different type of student than it was 10 years ago from the students that were 20 years from then it's, it's changed. A little bit and so you know now what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage people to expand their knowledge base as far as carrying concealed you know there's 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 a lot that goes into it i'm not saying that you can't just go down to a gun store buy a firearm throw it on your hip and start carrying it's your it's your constitutional right um and so i fully endorse that but what i suggest is okay now now that you have that firearm on your body how are you prepared to actually use that or be in a situation that would require you to use that? Have you thought this through, you know, and, and what we're really talking about is like the first, the first obstacle for a lot of new gun owners is the acknowledgement that, you know, you're now armed with a deadly force weapon that requires deadly force justification to employ. Do you know what deadly force justification is? Do you understand at a very, very entry level, what the law states for that, you know, and each state is a little different. I know the law in Nevada and the law in Texas, they're similar, but there's nuances that you need to be familiar with as a, as a resident of each of these states. And it's important that you take that initiative, if you will, to understand when you can and can't use deadly force. I think that's because one of the biggest complaints that we had with we did a poll of a lot of the students that we had that came through to get their license to carry here in the state of Texas. And what we discovered was probably around 65 to 70 percent of them had already put in all had already received their license to carry, but were not carrying. Yeah. And so we asked them in this poll, what was the reason? And we gave them like five answers. We gave them five selected answers. And one of those answers was did not understand the law. And that was the number one reason that people weren't carrying. So for, for, for that reason, we try to encourage people to have a decent, just a very decent level understanding of the law. Like what does deadly force mean? Then if they can get past that gateway, the next thing is, okay, well, you know, how do you use it in a deadly force encounter? Now that you understand when to use it, the next question is how to use it. And that's a little bit harder question because as you know, this is a, it's an art that like any martial art requires time 
invested in order to become at to some level proficient. And like, there's a lot of, nobody has really come out and said how long you need to train to be proficient. We've mapped it out and it's, it's about 80 to 90 hours for you to have to, for you to move from level one to level two. So that's, you know, most people are going to tap out before they get there. They're just not willing to, to invest 80 hours into that. Those that do become, uh, in, you know, like just in, you know, they, they become so in, interested in learning more. So they're now become more invested in learning. So we, we lose a lot of people that just feel like, okay, that's enough. I don't even know this much, but then we gain so many others. And, and one of my directives in my position is to, to not just train, but to educate people. Right. And what I mean by educating is educating them on all things, not just on how to use a gun or why to use a gun, but the fact that as citizens of this great nation, we can use a gun. And that is an, a right recognized by our creator, not something that was given to us. That That's the big misconception that a lot of people have. And so that's one of the things that I like to do is to help people understand, no, you weren't given this right. Our founding fathers acknowledged that this was a right that we were all endowed with. Right. And so that hopefully creates more you know, new ambassadors, new role models, new people to carry the fight into the next generation, if you will, because, you know, I obviously will be involved for as long as, as I, as long as I am capable or possible, but I also am concerned that the next generation of, you know, folks that support and defend our constitution have a good understanding of the why, why do we do this? Why? This is the why, you know, we, Here's the when, here's the how, but here's the why. And the why to me is the most important. It's like, it demonstrates to me what it means to live in a free society. Yeah. The fact that the second amendment protects the first amendment. And without the first amendment, which I believe is the most powerful amendment, but it's only as powerful in its current form because the second amendment exists. If the Second Amendment didn't exist, the First Amendment would have no power. Right. It would be like any other, you know, any other propaganda machine, which very close to looking at it at this day and age, but no, we're still far from it. I've been in places where I understood what propaganda was. Yeah. We're close, but we're not there. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting too to see the people on um, <clears throat> I I think it's this. I, like some people come in by it honestly and other people just it's almost like they they haven't thought about the responsibility aspect of 100%. what they have you know and some people it's overwhelming I, you know people i know people that literally it took them weeks after training to even think about start caring you know they, yeah. they were at a really work and then that's Very great normal. I mean, that means they're putting thought into it which is which 100%. Is i think you know what what's one of the great reasons I want to have you on is because you've really been thinking about concealed carry from various standpoints for a really long time, long before it got, you know, to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And will you educate people? Like I've, I've heard some ridiculous stuff. I've heard people say, well, you know, um, maybe I don't, maybe I don't care if people see that I have a gun because it'll be a deterrent, you know, and, mm. and like that. And, and my thought process, is I understand what they're, it's a naive approach um, from the standpoint of the last thing you want to do with your own self-protection, like you said, is draw attention, mm -hmm. you know, on, on anything. I don't want anybody to know that I have any training whatsoever um, because if I need to use it, I want it to be as much of a surprise as possible on that, you know, and that's why, you know, my whole thing is, you know, my persona people don't know me i try to come off as like the lovable meathead you know gym guy you know just hey how you doing i want everybody comfortable around me jokey i could see that because because you know that's the that to me that's great because first of all my build and everything that's an easy persona for me to do i know gym yeah. culture really well and everything and 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 i kind of do that and it puts people at ease um that way uh but the, the idea of caring you know can you 
can you talk to why it's worth putting the time in to really make sure that you're making the right selections on, you know, not only the weapon you're carrying, but the holsters, yeah. how you use your clothing, what to think about. I mean, these are things that people, when I talk to them, they, they really don't consider. And then the other thing, Jeff, can you talk to him? Okay. After we've done all that and I've got the clothing, I feel really good. A lot of them don't realize because they don't train enough fully, you know, concealed, you know, what does that do to my draw? What does that, where are the times, how often have I practiced, you know, the way yeah. I carry, you know? So first that's all, that's a, it's a great collection of thoughts and a lot of things to unravel there. The, the idea of open carry versus concealed carry. The way that I try to share my observations about the difference between the two is, is you're clearly in, in some States, I should say this in some States, it's your right to carry openly. And I'm not arguing for that. If you want to carry openly, go for it. I feel as though you're doing yourself a disservice and here's why. Um, when, when I was married in my, my first marriage, the, uh, the traveling that I was doing, particularly overseas and, and domestically meant that my, uh, my ex-wife was, she was it. She was the number one man, right? Okay. So she had to do everything. And I had this conversation with another lady one morning. I, I would, my routine would be sometimes early in the morning, I would take the boys, we'd go have lunch or breakfast at a local place, let my ex-wife sleep in. And when we were there one time, there was um, a lady sitting in the booth next to me and she started, she, she kind of like, I don't remember what it was, but it had something to do with guns, right? And I was living in Arizona at the time and Arizona was an open carry state. So it was very common and, and where I lived, it was very common to see people carrying openly. Yeah. And um, what, what happened was, the the lady saw something she she started laughing and like there was this oh god this this like condescending attitude that she had towards this individual and i started laughing with her or i should say at the same time as she was laughing but i was laughing at her right and the reason that i was laughing at her and she kind of like she she uh she looked up and she saw me laughing and she's like right 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 i'm like no no you misunderstand i'm laughing at you and she's like what do you mean i'm like well i just was sitting here i was observing you you had this issue with this individual that was open carrying i get it okay but here's here's the reason why i don't I, i'm glad that you have that opinion and the reason that i'm glad that you have that opinion is because if a violent criminal actor has to make a choice between selecting at the time, my wife or you, he's going to select you. Yeah. He's not going to select my, my ex-wife because she's, she's got a different mindset, right? She's, she's. And so the reason why I kind of bring that up is that you make yourself out to be, um, even though it's your right to do it, you create an opportunity that wouldn't exist if you were to carry concealed. And, and that's the whole thing about it. Like it's, it's about opportunity because a lot of crimes, violent crimes are, are opportunistic in nature. Very few of them are planned. If it's a planned event, that's a whole different story. But most of these are ambushes yeah. that just happen. To, they happen because of the timing and the opportunity that is present. And if you can break one of those, obviously you can't break the timing because you're there, right? But the opportunity if you can diffuse that situation by not having a firearm, that can create a whole different circumstances. And the reason why I say it that way is because number one, it's illegal for a felon to be in possession of a firearm. It's illegal for them to purchase a firearm, okay? So how do they come about being in possession of a firearm? Exactly. The only way they uh, can get a firearm is through theft. Yeah. So if you're carrying a firearm in the open, we have seen an increasing trend of firearm theft from on body. And there's lots of CCT video of it happening in convenience stores. The one that I really love is one that happened in a, it looked like a big box store, like a Target or a Walmart. And the gentleman was walking in. It was a, um, 
uh, kind of like had a big open doorway that had the girls and the, the boys on this side and the girls on this side. And the guy was cutting across the big open doorway and there's a corner he's going to wrap around. And as he gets past that threshold of the big open doorway, this other gentleman comes into the view and he just wraps around. And as the guy turns the corner to go into the actual men's room, he literally just grabs the gun out of the holster, sticks it in his pocket, turns around and is already out the, well, he's not out the store at that point, but he's already making his way to be out the store. Three to five seconds pass before the, the guy who had his gun just stolen from him realizes that he just had his gun stolen. And he's walking out there with his like expression like, did anybody just see that? What happened? Where'd my gun go? You know, it's gone that fast, yeah. that quickly. So that's my caution to people. It's, it's like the idea that it acts as a talisman. Sure, there might be an instance where that could work but you are far more likely to be the victim of a of a, of a theft of firearm theft than you are of a, of a of a violent crime like and well of course that can become a violent crime but the theft of the firearm is the motive is the is the intention behind the act and that's what we're trying to avoid so don't think of it from the terms of, oh, I want to ward off evil spirits with my my firearm. What you're trying to ward off is the opportunity for somebody to come up and grab that gun off your body. Right. And take it. Because the moment they have it in their hands, <laughs> that's yeah. a loaded gun that they're pointing at you. Yeah. You don't really have a lot of options at that point to try to get the gun back. So well, well, and, that, and the idea from a deterrent standpoint, I always tell people, I said, that works on everybody I don't care about. You know, I mean, I really, it, that's not who we're training for, you know. Um, that's and, so true. You know. And, and there's one other thing to consider. All right. Um, yes, we want to maintain a low profile. Yes, we want to maintain. And you alluded to it a little bit earlier. This is really nice that we're having this conversation about it because a good friend of mine, Mike Pannon, literally had a conversation. I, I haven't followed up with him, but I saw this on his post. And it's not that I disagree with him, but I, I feel like there is more to it. And that is a, a, a special operations, you know, mantra that we would, or maxim, I should say, which is speed, surprise, or surprise, speed, and violence of action, right. right? That's kind of like what makes us work in these small unit kind of scenarios is that we have surprise, speed, and violence of action on our side. So one of those ingredients is surprise, right? And if you give up that element of surprise, it's a very huge deficit that you have to recover from in order to be combat effective. It is very hard for you to give up the surprise and try as the, um, as the victim to gain the upper hand and become the victor. It's really hard to do that, right? So if you can maintain the element of surprise by concealing that firearm, it's a game changer when and if you elect to introduce that firearm into that problem. But you don't have that option and you won't have that option if you choose to carry it openly. Right. That element of surprise is no longer on the table. And that's just, man, that is, people don't appreciate how valuable those three components are. Surprise, speed, and violence of action. And when you, when you take one of those away, it's like, it's like the leg of a table. When you take one of those points away, it, it's just not, you, you know, it doesn't work quite as well you, you know you're you're already reacting because you're you're in you're the defender not the attacker so you're in a reactionary mode so you know speed is not going to necessarily be on your side there either and so really it boils down to how violent how it, when we say violence of action a lot of times that is defined differently from a lot of people and for me it's about the surgical application of violence it's about the precision at which i use violence it's not just like going like berserker crazy. And I mean, obviously in your case, that would probably work with your size. With somebody like my size, I don't have that luxury. I have to be extremely surgical and precise with the with the the, the level and the use of the violence that I employ. And that's what makes violence of action successful. That's what makes it work. So folks that have an an, an idea that carrying it openly is a deterrent. I would argue that the the amount of times that it is a deterrent pales in the pales in comparison to the to the amount of times that it elevates you 
up into a victim, up to yeah. being a victim. Yeah, no, so, I, I absolutely agree. I heard you allude to that in another interview, and I, I wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. Um, you you also have you have great thoughts on on weapon selection and mm -hmm. and how you how you go about and think about it, and I think that's really important. But one thing I think I want to just hear more from you on is how do you select clothing without looking like tactical Tommy? You know, like, like a lot of the guys, a lot of the guys go and um, it's the same. It, it, I guess, I guess I remember back, back when I was at uh, Nemitsi and I'm going through everything. I used to go to this bar where all the, uh, all the unit guys used to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Rogues. I don't know if you remember. Oh yeah. Yeah. Rogues. All right. So you'd be there and you'd have half a dev group there and they all, yeah. They all look like bikers. They all had their their uh, their thing, their uh, pagers back then. Yeah, and yeah. everything, and, and everybody looked. It, it literally it looked like you know something out of Sons of Anarchy for the most part on it. And that, was, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a look back then. And that was something that you know the original guys all, all kind of fostered. But what was interesting was there's one guy I met, and this guy dressed in three piece suit. He had yeah. he had oval glasses. You know, oh, looked like an accountant. He was a he was a sniper. Really interesting dude. Same unit. You know, I drove a Volvo. <laughs> he, did, he did the complete eye and he worked obviously with a lot of other groups not just that group you know because yeah. of the whole thing so it was really interesting on that but he was the guy that you would just like you said he, not only would he blend in you'd make that assumption right away that you're dealing with a cpa or something mm. you, you know and so you kind of just yeah. this where everybody else kind of fit the the you know the look and the feel yeah of that no that's not against those guys it was it was a lot that, that totally get it in. but you you really came up with with, with the idea that I forgot what you had said in another interview, but it was the idea of the clothing selection and, and the fact that, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to really imprint and, and you don't think that's a big deal, it's the same thing as kind of almost open carry. Again, it takes that surprise away from anybody right. and anybody who's really casing the place or looking around, you know, like, like you made a really good point about, you know, law enforcement officers are always, always checking for that kind of stuff. Um, it, again, it brings attention to you and, and the idea of dressing to not bring attention to you, I think is such an important concept. And I don't think it's really emphasized as much in, in sure. concealed carry as, as I think it should be. Well, it, it's tough because the hard part is this. Like I try to tell people, listen, I want you again to live your life. If you want to live your life loud and proud as an American, hey, I got no problem with that. That's that's beautiful. And I'm, I'm always going to support it. But again, realize that you are, that does in some cases potentially elevate you as a as a victim or as a, as a target. Let's just say as a target, maybe not a victim. But if you're willing to take on that risk, okay. But you have to acknowledge, okay, what I'm doing and how I'm doing it can in some cases elevate my risk. I acknowledge that. I take it on board. I'm responsible. Okay. Versus somebody that just kind of just doesn't do that. And then all of a sudden they're surprised. Right. So when it comes to the, um, to your wardrobe, you know, one of the things that we have folks is we have a very specific gear list that students are required to bring to class. And I've had people tell me, I don't own one of those. I'm like, I don't care. Right. Go to Goodwill and get one. Right. because if you know and i've had people tell me and it's so funny because i remember this one guy he was hell-bent on not wanting to have this one piece of clothing this one piece of this one wardrobe and i was like dude it's 30 bucks at target it can't possibly be that big of a deal right and, right. and he's like well i'm never gonna ever ever use this and i remember he um i saw on his social media how he traveled to a training class that was out of his home state, which was a Southern state and how it was really cold and how he, it, you know, he had to go out and buy clothes to, to wear, to help keep him warm while he was there. And it just so happened that one of the articles of clothing that he bought was the one that he was so adamant about not buying. And it, I, I got, I don't want to say I got a little bit of a kind of like, uh, you know, gratification from that but it was one of those things where you know you can't say that you're never going to wear that right um it's just it's it behooves you to instead be familiar with the the pros and cons to each piece of wardrobe what it what it brings to the table yeah. and then again you acknowledge okay you know what like um i've got to dress up tomorrow for a fancy dinner with a good friend of mine and that means that my my loadout will be a little different. 
Yep. And it's just because, you know, the, the wardrobe that I'm wearing is restrictive in the sense of, could I carry the same? I could, but I also run the risk of a um, unintentional brandishing or printing of my equipment. And it's just not worth it for me to do that. I can do a better job carrying it in another manner and still have a very nice in, in engaging social event. So yeah. the problem is that a lot of times people try to put that square peg into a round hole. Right. And when we force people to bring all these various types of wardrobes out, what we're doing is we're teaching what we call defeat methodology. And defeat methodology is a universal approach towards whatever cover garments that you're wearing. doesn't matter. Right. And the reason why it works and it works extremely well is because it's universal. And it doesn't require like back in the day we used to I remember we used to take um, lead shot and put it inside the, the, the hem of the button down shirt so that when we would throw the hem, throw the shirt out of the way, there was some weight to it. It would kind of move with purpose. We used to put loose change in the pockets of the vest that we would wear. I mean, you know, we, we did these things to customize our clothing. But what that meant was we had to customize every piece of clothing. Right. And that's just not practical. You can't like I can't take every suit that I have to my tailor and have him up armor it for daily care. Right. I know that some people have to, um, in some cases, do something like that. But I think the average person doesn't need to. I think you can get away with it if you just have a little bit of understanding of what what it really means. So, like I tell people, um, you have to cover you have to cover your bases. So you have to think about it from the environmental conditions. Right. We all have seasons. Some of us, I mean, we have we have hot and hotter here, just like you. You know, there's there's really no we don't go four seasons here, but other places they do. And so you have to deal with what's my summertime wardrobe? What's my wintertime wardrobe? OK. And how are they different? Because sometimes those two differences can mean an actual different firearm in and of itself. Yeah. You know, summertime fire, summertime. What makes summer in the in extreme heat difficult is the comfort. Right. And one of the most important things that you as a concealed carrier do is that you be comfortable with what you're carrying. Right. And that ties in with the firearm, uh, like how to select a firearm question. The smaller, the better, in my right. opinion. The smaller of a firearm you get, the lighter, the less footprint and the less real estate it's going to take up on your body, which means that most likely it's going to become more comfortable than a larger framed firearm. And smaller doesn't mean you're outgunned or you're less, you have less capability. It might mean that you have a smaller magazine capacity, mm -hmm. but domestic de uh, defensive gun uses do not have magazine reloads as, as a, as a integral part of their performance. There, there's in fact, I can't think of a defensive gun use from a private citizen that required a reload. So what I'm getting at is that magazine capacity is not as critical, but it feels good. Yeah. Right. I want, oh, this has, this has eight, this has 10, this has 15, this has 21. And we keep going down this rabbit hole. Well, as the magazine capacity increases, the footprint increases. That means size and weight increase. Yeah. And then you start to get into the, because it, it could be a great gun. I'm not saying that it's not a good gun, but if it if it does not create a comfortable environment for you to carry on an everyday basis, then it's not going to get carried. Yeah. And then how good of a gun is it really at that point? The smaller gun that you might feel is like uh, under, you know, it's it's less powerful for whatever reason, however people think of these things, you know, the fact that you have it on you makes it more powerful than the gun that was left in the safe or on the nightstand that somebody didn't bring because it's not comfortable to carry on them in an extreme heat or extreme cold condition. So like you have to be smart about how you choose your, your firearm. And then there are some wardrobes that like uh, we're seeing a tremendous influx of females in the shooting world and particularly concealed carry. And I am thankful for that. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see that. Um, <clears throat> number one, uh, there are from a from a couple's point of view now there's two guns involved right right um and so that just makes things uh, so different so different i just I, I did a we did um 
we have this one video series. It's not, it hasn't been released yet, but I'll give a little teaser. One of the videos, and so we do this thing where we observe the, the various gunfights caught on camera and we extrapolate the skills that you need in this case. Like, what did this video? This video had a one arm draw. This video had, you know, whatever. This video had, or, you know, shooting from a seated position, whatever the case might be. So we actually had a shooting of a couple, well, not of a couple, but two off duty police officers, male and female that were in a restaurant that was robbed and they both responded to it. So, you know, obviously two guns that they were carrying made that situation a lot better to solve than just one gun, if you will. Right. So, um, you know, I like that idea. When you get into the actual um, wardrobe restrictions, there, people will say, well, I can't carry if I'm wearing this wardrobe. Okay, and I, I respond by asking a question. You can't carry the gun that you like, or you can't carry any gun in that wardrobe. Right. And the response generally is, I can't carry the gun that I like. And what I mean by like is the gun that they carry all the time. Yeah. You know, it's the gun that's got all the bells and whistles on mm -hmm. it. You know, it's got like a 17 round magazine, a flashlight. It's got some sort of, you know, might even have a mini red dot on there. It's got, you know, threaded barrel, all this extra stuff. And I'm not saying that stuff isn't good. I'm not saying that it's not necessary. I'm saying the reason why you're telling me that, because I had a guy tell me that he missed out on going to a buddy's wedding because he couldn't carry his gun. I'm like, what do you mean you couldn't carry your gun? Or what do you mean you couldn't carry a gun? Is it, was it at a, like I, in my head when I heard that, I'm thinking they had it at a venue that prohibited guns. Right. That's what I thought. Right. Okay. And he's like, no, I couldn't carry it in the, in the tuxedo that I was wearing. I'm like, you have no other gun that you could have taken to that venue that would have allowed you to do that. Wow. And because he literally, he said, yeah, I, I didn't go to a wedding because of a, I couldn't carry a gun. And it just like, it floored me. Yeah. I'm like, was this like a extended family member that you didn't really care about? He's like, no, it was a good friend of mine from college, buddy that I, you know, went four years with. And, you know, we kind of went our separate ways. But we stay in touch. We see each other pretty frequently. And I'm like, dude, what the, you know, like, you know, and, because in his head, in his head, he saw that this is the gun that I carry with me every day. If I can't carry this, I can't, I'm not going there. And that's what I meant by just live your life, yeah. but be armed in the process, yeah. right? Focus less on putting self-imposed restrictions on yourself and more about like, this gets into problem solving. Like not everything is a perfect solution, right? Like I would love it to be a perfect solution, but they're not always a perfect solution. But the reason why they work is because we identify this as being an imperfect solution and we work to try to make it a perfect by training and by preparing. And that's, that's the secret in a sense. So, you know, I, I know that he was disappointed but you could hear it in his voice after um, that, that, is, that, that was a decision that I'm sure he regretted, but in his, at that time, and this had happened like four or five years before the class. So at that time, he had in his head, you know, that's that's the thing. And, and, and granted, there are some places obviously you shouldn't go, right? You shouldn't go to places that are high risk. Right. But that clearly wasn't an that, that wasn't an example of a high risk. No. I mean, unless it was like in a freaking, you know, downtown Chicago, some right. you know, you know, like that, but not that Chicago's a shithole, but some place in downtown Chicago that could be a shithole. Yeah. So, you know, it was like, damn, man, that just really kind of that hurt me. Yeah. To think that I would not go to something, an important event, because I couldn't carry a firearm. That's the other problem that I get, I, I get, or I see in the industry is that everything has to be a gun solution. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, man, I, I tell you what, there are some places that I can't take a gun into, mm -hmm. you know, as a private citizen these days, I'm restricted in what, where I can go and what I, when I can take a firearm, you know, yeah. that, I, that just is the, that's just the, you know, I don't agree with it. But those are the rules that I have to play by. Yeah. Right. So it's frustrating, but guys have to take a take a moment to kind of really evaluate that and, and figure out, okay, how can I solve this problem? What is, what do I have? And that's why for me, small is the solution because in that in that platform, that small platform, I have versatility. Yes. I have adaptability. Yeah. I can. I'm not restricted. And when people say, well, you're not going to shoot that gun as well as you could shoot a larger gun, that's more, that's a, 
I, I feel like that's less important, right? Because again, if we're studying defensive gun use, gunfights, they're happening at close range. So distance and precision is not necessarily a criterion there. I'm not saying you shouldn't be accurate with that. And I am, I, I enjoy shooting at distance with these micros. There are not a lot of fights that are really being resolved at extended ranges. There's very few of them that are. I mean, the average, you know, is going to be inside of about seven yards, like 70% inside of seven yards or more. So, you know, that, and I'm not saying that that's an excuse not to train at distance. I'm just saying that from a defensive gun use perspective, the argument for me carrying this wonder gun is less valid because I don't need all of those, you know, bells and whistles that supposedly are going to make me a better shot. That gun doesn't make me a better shot. I'm the one that makes myself the better shot. So, you know, you, you run into those kind of issues. And so when you can find that a platform that has the versatility and adaptability, now the world is your oyster. You yeah. can go to these venues. You can go to your, you know, long-term college roommate wedding. You're just not carrying like you normally would. And that's the other thing that I try to get across to people is like, you need to start expanding your horizons when it comes to your method of carry. You know, you should have a primary, but you should have a secondary and a tertiary. You should have three different methods for carrying a firearm. Um, and then when you can't carry a firearm, what can you carry? Right. And how well are you trained on those tools, right? So I have a primary, secondary, and, you know, basically a backup to all of that. And, and then if I can't carry any of that, well, what can I carry? You know, how am I going to be able to defend myself with those tools that I have? And I think that kind of is, you know, obviously the reason why we carry firearms is because it does create a more equal battlefield for mm -hmm. a lot of us. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a similar um, sort of equilibrium with other tools. You know, you know, I'm a big proponent for edged weapons, big proponent for OC spray. I'm a big proponent for, you know, any type of combative style art, uh, you know, whether it be grappling or boxing. I think those are hugely underrated and hugely important to your overall game picture. You know, you have to have um, multiple tools at your disposal. That's what makes you so, that's what, that's what makes us so lethal. Yes. Is that there's multiple tools at my disposal, not just one. And, um, you know, the hard part is getting across to people that you don't need to have those those huge, like. Overly complicated for a new shooter platform, you know, you've got all these moving parts, you got all these features that you have to know, you have all these features you have to maintain. Yep. And that just puts a lot of onus on a new shooter. And I'm like, hey, you know what? You start carrying this, this vanilla out of the box plain Jane gun and you've been doing it for a year or two and you start to recognize that maybe you wanna explore some other options, good for you. That's a great kind of natural ascension towards something that makes sense because right. you know, you're, you're, you're developing time <clears throat> and rate. You put in the time to figure out how to carry this thing. Well, let me explore something a little different. Maybe I can look at a pistol mounted optic, or maybe I'm gonna go with a slightly bigger magazine, something with a little bit bigger magazine. Those are the types of, I think th those types, that group of people I think are incredibly smart, but they also, they take advantage of, you know, the, the way that our brain kind of processes things. We start with something simple and then we just keep adding to the plate. If we start with something so complex, it makes it hard for us to show any positive movement in a in a in a progressive manner. So, in other words, I don't really see much um, in return for my investment early on because there's a lot of moving parts, too many moving parts in some cases. It's funny you say that because uh, here in Vegas, there was a guy, um, really well trained individual. Uh, former military, former law enforcement, and he worked a lot in the industry here, uh, you know, where the all the girls from the clubs and, um, you know, you have girls that make some ungodly amount of money as cocktail waitresses out here and stuff. And they're going back to their cars at night. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, sometimes without, you know, they're and they were starting to get staked out um, at, at clubs, obviously, you know, gangsters watching and realizing, hey, this girl's, you know, cashing a lot. Um, so, this guy took a very a, a similar approach in in what he said was his first goal was to get them make it to where they they would always carry you know they they mm. go around armed how can I do that 
he yeah. found the least intimidating way to start them was with like a s and w bodyguard like a like just yeah. a hammerless boom they could put in there they didn't have to think about it it's just point and shoot it came in yeah. it was it was a low threshold it, is it the most optimal you know what no yeah. but it was one that they would carry and then yeah. they would start it and then yeah. as they got a little more comfortable then some of the the, the women would say hey you know what i'm I, I'd like to add something more to this, maybe something a little that, that has either a lot larger round capacity or I really want to get better at shooting. Yeah. And stuff. But what was interesting was the, the whole idea was exactly like, like I love what you advocate. It's like, hey, I just want you to have a great life, but go about it armed. Therefore, what does that mean to you right now? And where's your comfort level? And don't worry about so much about the platform. Does it have all the bells and whistles? Exactly. Get, get comfortable carrying it, get comfortable training with it you know, see how you like it. And then you will, I, I just know I've changed over the years of what I like to carry oh, yeah. what I could do and new stuff oh, yeah. comes out and you're like, Oh, okay, this is good. This is bad. I didn't used to be a red dot guy. I'm a red dot guy now. Cause I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to you us know? all, man. It happens you to know? us all. Um, I mean, true. I, I gave all the technical reasons. Everybody tells me you go, you switch to red dot, but I mean, let's be honest, you know, it's like, Oh, there's that dot. Boom. Yeah. Oh. It's easy. Um, but uh, but what I find so funny about that is I, I do think you're right. I think it, it, any in any kind of training like this, the more you can take down as an instructor, the intimidation factor. Anything I can oh, do yeah. to cut through the intimidation factor for my clients, you know that that's so great. And, and you're just the way you lay things out, or it's just so great because it's not you're not saying, hey, I can't, it's not that I can't get you to where you can be comfortable with a platform like this. But why do that? You know, what is the mm -hmm. real goal? Or the real goal is you want to make sure that you have that, you know, that black swan that's event true. ability. And, yeah. and so how can we give this to you in a way that's, you know, easy for you to progress and, and get comfortable with it, you know? Well, the thing that really changed, it's not that it changed my mind, but the thing that really helped sell me on this was that we had, we had people that were coming from tough places. You know, they were single parents, um, they had lower incomes. They had other other problems in their life, and we were trying to simplify as much as we could for them. And it really became it boiled down to what's going to make you feel better right now. And a lot of times, you know, you have to kind of peel that layer, peel that onion a little couple layers to get down to the real. The real response and, and a lot of times it was just about not feeling defenseless yeah and and so okay so what do you feel will help you to not feel defenseless and it's never something like a oh i want this make and model i want a p365 xl mm -hmm. it was just i want a gun yeah and so when we start that journey or, you know, we as a collective, when we start that journey, I feel as though um, is somebody, obviously, if you're, if you're buying something from a reputable main manufacturer, you have less, less concern. Uh, but sometimes that can also mean a higher price tag. So that's right. a, that's a, that's a, it's a real tricky scale to walk or path to walk there. But I feel like a lot of times when we get to that point and they have been able to identify what it is specifically you know, I, I don't want to feel defenseless. And when we can, I, okay, well, what's going to help you to not feel defenseless? A gun. Okay, well, let's talk about a gun. What can you afford? And when we start putting in context of, you know, pistols that are affordable, you know, I mean, there are a lot more pistols in that smaller size that are available and affordable. And that, you know, I would rather somebody defend themselves at point blank range with a gun than have the quote unquote best gun because it was, you know, so and so social media influencer had it. It was on the cover of so and so magazine, whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm not interested per se in that. I want something that's gonna that's gonna help you to feel less defenseless and empowered and motivated to train and to become more educated. And it's a formula that does it doesn't work for everybody, clearly. But it works for a lot of people, a vast majority of people that with time, they start to kind of, they figure it out. They start realizing, okay, you know what? All right, let's explore this. Let's try this. And, you know, I, I kind of use um, this idea as like a, 
like like I use the the phrase gateway drug. You know, this right. is like a gateway drug methodology. Get them involved in something. From there, let them start to sort out exactly the path they want to go on. And once they find that new path, then you provide them with all those real nitty gritty details and all the information that you kind of maybe didn't you didn't data dump on them early on because you didn't just you know you, number one is probably going to get you know dumped. And number two, it probably really doesn't matter to them at that point. You know, what matters is they have something, they understand how to use it, they understand when to use it. Yeah. And that's that's what we're looking at here. That's what we're trying to get. And I think if more people started to appreciate that, um, we would have far, I think we would have a reduction in crime, not because more people are carrying it, but because more people are aware. Yeah. That's the key thing. More people, because one of the things that we talk about when you start to carry a firearm is the single most important skill that you develop has nothing to do with trigger control, has nothing to do with recoil control, has everything to do with situational awareness. Yeah. Maintaining an active situational awareness anytime you're in public is the single most critical skill that you can learn. And the moment that we tie that in with the reason why you feel defenseless is because you feel as though you can be overpowered. Well, when does that over when how how does that overpowering occur? Does it occur like like this, like somebody just beam down and all of a sudden you've got your opponent, or does it materialize through this kind of escalation? You see somebody off to the side, maybe he's in the shadows. You're moving to your vehicle. He starts to parallel, you know, vector his trajectory towards you. He starts to get a little bit closer where you can make up facial features. There's no reason for him to be coming to where you are because your vehicle is the only one parked in that part of the parking lot, right? All of these things are subtle clues that are incredibly important because they allow you to escalate not just your situational awareness, but how you're going to react, what you're going to do. It starts to create in your head these little formulas like, okay, how am I going to solve this problem? If he keeps coming to me here and he reaches this threshold, I'm going to turn around and go back into the building. That's plan A, right? Plan B, maybe I can't go back in the building. So now I need to start moving away and creating a little bit more distance. Plan B may not work. Plan C may be I have to, you know, verbally challenge him and be that kind of like hard ass and say, hey, back up. I don't want anything to do with you. You know, but those are the types of things. Those tools are not on the table if you don't have situational awareness. Because if they are able to execute, if they use the surprise, speed, and violence of action against you, well, that's a hard, that's a hard, that's a hard fight, right? Because the number one, the biggest element they have is that surprise. So if you can take surprise off their table, it's like we were talking about earlier. You take surprise off the table and it's it hobbles you in many ways. So, you know, being situationally aware is key. And what happens is that as we introduce a fireman to their lifestyle, the situational awareness goes hand in hand with it. And that to me is almost more important than a handgun, because if they're maintaining situation awareness, they have the ability to not only de-escalate but remove themselves from potentially harmful or dangerous situations. Something that they may not have done well beforehand, but now they're more incentivized to do it because now deadly force is a legitimate concern. You, if you use deadly force, you expose yourself to a tremendous amount of litigation. And that litigation alone could have been avoided if you had maintained situational awareness and acted somewhat differently. You backed up or you de-escalated the situation or you did a myriad of other types of options rather than just be surprised immediately trying to go to guns. Right. Because that's the only option that's in your head. That's the one option that you think is always on the table, going to guns. So my, my recommendation is that when people bring a, a, a firearm into their lifestyle, that not only is it changing their lifestyle, but it should improve their lifestyle as it relates to the situational awareness. Maintain because that situational awareness not only helps you in, you know, obviously defensive gun use scenarios, but it helps you when you're driving, paying attention to what's happening around you. On the job site, if you're working in a hazardous environment where you have to stay, you know, pay attention to everything that's happening around you, that situational awareness is a very important skill to develop, even more so in those cases. So it has other advantages that can be applied in other facets of your life that don't just resolve around defensive gun use or violent, violent criminal actions. It's, it's way more, way more valuable. And like when I was talking about, well, what do I not have? If I can't carry a gun, what do I have? Well, I will always have situational awareness. 
I will always have that. And, you know, like, you know, the old adage of, you know, um, you know, you, you are the weapon. That's the key is that you are the weapon. If you can take that situational awareness and use it to your advantage, you can remove yourself from the situation. You can put yourself in a position of advantage. You can start to de-escalate the situation. You can put, you can put the terms of the engagement in your hands. You can say something like, well, I will do this if he does that. And then you can execute using that surprise that we talked about through speed and violence of action. That's a whole, and that is a game changer when people can actually take that on. And when people like, when you have that light bulb moment about situational awareness and you realize, oh, man, that's, so, I, you know, I, I didn't think of it in those terms. And there's a lot of resources out there that talk more detail about what situational awareness really is, because it's a catchphrase that gets thrown around a lot. And I take it for granted that people can understand it by me just saying a few sentences, but in some cases, yes, in some cases, no, some Sometimes people need to do a little bit more research and understanding of what situational awareness really means to them. Dude, there's so many more subjects that I want to go into with you. Um, but what you just did, it's the perfect place to stop the first conversation because you you made such salient points just now. Uh, right. What I really wanted people to hear, you know, the, I wanted them to hear the difference because, you know, I, I have to tread lightly because I have a lot of friends, uh, you know, that are in the world and, but there are so many quote unquote influencers out there in this world that are chest lumping a lot of stuff and just giving these really pat answers to EDC and all of this other stuff. It, what I love about what, what you do is you put out the nuance that's so needed mm. in this world mm. and in the way you're going. And that's why I, I highly encourage everybody, you know, obviously they'll have all our, all, all the contact information to really seek you out. And you know, if they're lucky enough, sign up for a course and, uh, and get training direct from you for that very reason, uh, because unlike a lot of people, you know, you've been thinking about this problem for a long time, you know, <laughs> how to carry visibility. Yes, you did it in the professional side, but also you've over the years that that was something that was just really, you, you were way ahead of the curve on thinking about that aspect of it. People make assumptions that people just because they're trained in special operations, that they mm. somehow are, are trained in low visibility and day-to-day -day carrying. And, uh, what's so nice about your evolution is you you're very aware of what the civilian faces you're mm. very aware of the things they need to think about um there are luxuries that you have within an organization you know when you're in the military and uh you have people around you that you, a lot of that stuff's taken care of for you um mm. most of the people where you're training it's going to be them okay. it's going to so be true. just them and they have to oh, think yeah. about all these things a hundred percent it's a hundred percent i I think you're right. It was a, it's not where I was going per se, but I think that that was a very important point that throughout the entire conversation that, you know, if somebody can take away a valuable piece of information, it's, it's the importance behind the situational awareness and, and how that plays into your day-to-day -day life. Well, Jeff, we'll have all the contact information up, but just sure. personally, where would you, where would you prefer people um, you know, if they like what they heard today and they want to hear more, yeah. they want to get more, where, where would you like to send them? So I would go to our website, which is tridentconcepts.com. And on our website is all of our social media links. So you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all those. I guess I can't say Twitter anymore because it's now X or whatever X that's going to be. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. Can somebody just keep them the same? Really? Please. <laughs> just like, oh. Anyhow, um, you can get all that information on there. If you go to our website, you can also see our course schedule, see where we're going to be traveling. Uh, one of the things that we realized, particularly over the pandemic, was that, you know, travel was a little, uh, training took on a little bit different nuance because travel and visiting and face-to-face -face contact was not there. So we we started doing um, like video consultations and video privates. And that's been, you know, so even if you can attend a training class, that doesn't mean you can get information or you can't spend time with me in that sense. So the private consultation stuff is things that we are really focusing on, particularly because what it does is it allows me to reach people that potentially would not have been able to attend any of our training courses. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I, I think if folks are very interested in the concealed carry world, then the book, the concealed carry manual uh, is also available on our website. You can get that or you can go to concealedcarryingmanual.com and learn a little bit more about that. And that's a tooth to tail treaty on uh, carrying concealed. It goes over a little bit of what we talked about in greater detail. Uh, so that might be a good follow-up to folks if they're interested in, in learning a little bit more. That's a, that's one, one area. And 
you know, obviously, you know, we're happy to entertain questions. Folks can always reach out to us via our website. There's a contact form on our website. We'll do our best to get back to you in a timely manner. And, you know, hope to see more people in and around on the training training floors. Same, same, brother. Well, listen, I'll be out your way in the fall for sure. And uh, I'm sure nice. I'll end up, are you, you think you're going to come back for a shot show this year? Undecided. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. There, there's a home. strong possibility that I will, but there's a lot of actors in place right now. There's a lot of things happening, a lot of things changing there in Las Vegas. I'm not sure I'm happy about it. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But we, we, we still will, we still will probably come out. It might just be shorter. We may not be there for the whole week. Well, regardless, man, hopefully next time you're in Vegas, love to have you come by and, uh, and meet 100%. some folks. Um, I would love that. But listen, folks, uh, Jeff is one of those guys that, you know, you, you can see it's it's just thorough. It's really thorough. It's there. Uh -huh. The ego, you know, yeah, very approachable, all of that, all the things that I think are essential in when you're learning lethal fourth application. So I uh, appreciate that. Again, bro, thanks so much for making the time and uh, yeah. look forward to connecting soon. Absolutely, brother. Love it. Right, right. Be well. Adios.